While we are waiting for, for students, if there is any questions, I'm happy to address. When um, will the class be working? This is the class be Today? Yeah. Uh, one fifty. Okay. So I have an important Zoom meeting to attend at two, so I will have to escape around 1.15. Um, yeah. You can try to drag me out another three minutes or so, but after that, I will absolutely have to escape. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's it. Still one more minutes to go. Okay, so formal two is up. Uh, have fun. I don't think I made it any difficult. So mostly filling in steps that I didn't have time to show. So so that you can teach your head to learn quantum, quantum field theory. Okay, go through that. Uh, do it. Um, so deadline is two weeks from now, and I will try to do more more regularly than than I have been doing so far. <laughs> So, so that you have more chance to work QFT by hand. Um, okay, so anyway, that's just the thing. So again, homework two is up. Uh, deadline is here for now. Uh, good. So, uh, so this is the second makeup. In a sense, not making up. So this is making up anticipating the lecture that I will have to miss. So the next Wednesday, I won't be here. So I will be somewhere else. I will hold. So I will, we will have to miss like next Wednesday. There won't be lecture either. So that will be like this. Will be making up that work already. Um, so then uh, we will have to make uh, like four more times, something like that. Now Friday is out. Is that true? Okay. Uh, realistically. We, we are like 37 people. So I think we have to pick some exact, exact time zone, something that nobody imagining of having any lectures. So uh, you have to suffer four times. I'm saying you have to suffer four evenings, I guess. Anyway, so we will have to choose some time. Uh, so, so let's do some doodle thingy. Um, well, I, mean, I can make some poll on the canvas. So. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, I can give you my working spots. Which will be mostly exotic. Uh, do you prefer like eight a.m. or do you prefer like seven p.m.? That's much. <laughs> I feel. I can do. All right. So anyway, uh, good. So let's let's get started. Homework two is up. Uh, enjoy. And next Wednesday there will be a lecture. So today we will finish the discussion about the Ken Parody and time reversal. Okay, and then we will be the end of the discussion about the symmetries. Noiser's theorem and so on. And from next time, we will start building up for the later theory. So let's let's start with the parody. We already talked about the charge that we did a lot of time. Did I? Yes. Okay, well, I did it. So let's talk about parity. Parity, um, this is known as parity. <clears throat> Obviously, a uh, blitz is a spatial part, but without flipping time part. Okay, so that's clear. As, as one of the possible space set transformations, there is no guarantee that quantum field theory respect the parity, but nevertheless, we can ask, okay? So if you remember, I said at the beginning that the full Poincaré group is pretty big, and then we only focus on orthochronous proper, proper part, the rest can be reached by parity and time reversal. And then I told you that already back then that there is no guarantee that local quantum field theory respect the full Poincaré symmetry, but we know that so far it respects the orthochronous proper part. Okay, so this is the discussion about what about the rest. Okay, so let's again talk about the uh, scalar field theory, but then uh, uh, how, how do we think about it? So the question is okay, can I have a unitary operator that incorporates the uh, symmetry transformation? All right, so let's again study the theory in terms of simple uh, real scalar field theory. Um, so let us start with the zero version and then we will build up to the fifth, like, uh, fifth uh, five different uh, theories. 
we will study to, to understand the, the meaning of parity. So here, what, what is the parity operation? The parity operation is given a field, which is a function of x and t, and then imagining that, okay, so for that purpose, let me just see, uh, uh, consider the possibility that there are a bunch of scalar fields. Okay, just for the, for the sake of it. Uh, then parity, and even you can have a different mass, doesn't matter. So, so parity, I imagine there's a linear transformation of taking a field, which is defined as x and t, and then I'm relating, I'm, I'm relating that as a linear combination of, of fields at minus x and t. Okay, so that's the transform, the parity transform field. And then the question is whether this act, for instance, can be invariant under that operation for any choice of M at all. Okay? And so far, we don't know what M is going to work for us. And we will go through five different examples. Okay? So, in terms of operator, what I mean is so this can be written as there's a parity operator, but in this case, I'm assuming there's a unitary, unitary realization. I was saying, okay, let's imagine performing parity transformation on this, and that uh, imagining that looks like a B, B, B. Okay, so then the question is whether there's a proper choice of M such that it leads to the actual invariant. Okay. So now let's let's go through this exercise. Suppose we first consider the case where I have only single consider the case where I have only single scalar real. Yeah. Okay. Then we can imagine put plug it back in. But for now, let's consider two different cases where I I will consider uh, P and P prime. So in other words, I will consider two different possibilities for M matrix. In this case, it's a single number, right? Because I consider a single real scalar. All right. So in the first case. I will consider what is known as a scalar transformation law, which comes with a plus sign. This is going to be a scalar law. And in the second case, we'll consider going to the minus sign. Oops. This will be the pseudo scalar. <laughs> Okay, so let's check whether that thing can be invariant. So here, I will do it explicitly, because so this is the first time. So S0 will be transformed as G for X. So I'm just going to do this active transformation. I'm not going to put space in time. I'm just going to make this field transformation. Okay, so, uh, so that's going to be one, one half. Let me even be pedantic, dt phi of minus t of x. In this case, oh, uh, so so let's let let me give uh, give give in uh, this. I just call this to be m. Okay, so I'm just making two different choices. So in this case, since I'm looking at the case where this is quadratic theory, right? There is overall m square, right? Oh, because of that thing. So let me just pull out m square. Which is the number either plus or minus one where M is. And then let me just write uh, derivative with respect to the spatial part to be like that notation. Okay, so uh, whatever uh, looks like that, sort of like. Okay, now uh, you know the following. So in the 1D integral, if you have a dx, which runs from the minus infinity to the infinity, you can make a change variable to call x prime is equal to minus x. So that does, first of all, there's a row minus sign e x prime, but also flips up, so it turns plus infinity to minus infinity. So that turns back into itself. So overall, what I'm trying to say is that under naive orientation flipping transformation, integral measure doesn't change. 
Okay, so overall, I'm just gonna write this overall thing as if I had integration over x, and then if I do my change of variable in such a way that it goes like minus less, that should equal to integration over the x. Okay, this is my notation to say uh, there is such a thing. Okay, so then uh, what I can do is I can make a change variable. So let's just make a change variable x prime goes to, sorry, x goes to minus that, meaning I just call that to be if you like x prime. So then uh, this thing, I'm just continuing this regulation elsewhere, there is a dt integration, which I don't touch anything. Since I'm making change of variable, then it will become minus x squared, sorry, integration over minus x. And then there's the dt integral. Now it comes back to the original thing. And then you see, if I flip this, in principle, it comes with a minus sign here, but it's a square, right? So that part, okay, let me just write this because again, just uh, the first time. This. <clears throat> okay, so as I told you, this is the same as itself, and that thing, because of that thing is equal to itself, right? So overall thing is this contract M square times F square. Okay? So this show, shows that uh, this is equal to this. Uh, so long as, as long as M square is equal to one. In fact, that's what I chose. If you consider either plus sign or minus sign. In principle, I could have said that, let me just consider every possible M there and ask which M we we'll leave actually the variable. And you learn that uh, in this case, there are two options, either plus sign or minus sign. Okay, good. So uh, this example, show, triple example, shows that this is a parity invariant. And then for this theory, I cannot tell whether this scalar needs to be like parity scalar or parity pseudo scalar. It works both ways. <laughs> okay, so that's the first triple example. And then now we're going to start building up slightly more complicated. Uh, or starting with interesting examples. Any questions? Yes. Um, I know uh, symmetric transformation mapping on state vectors must be unitary, but uh, I'm still confused. Uh, this transformation acting on field operator must be unitary or not. So this one. Yeah. So this is unitary. Here I'm assuming unitary. And last class I talked about, which I will talk about a little bit more soon, is that. There are the symmetries so a transformation that leaves the norm invariant can be either unitary or n unitary. Here, since I know that the parity can be realized in unitary transformation, I already assume that there's unitary. That's why you see this in the dagger. Uh, indeed, this is unitary transformation, if you like. My question is what happens uh, if I don't use unitary trans representation of the transformation yeah. when? when the transformation acting on field operator. Okay, so then what else? So just then, therefore, your question is, what is, can we do like anti unitary Is that is that your question? Unitary and unitary or other transformation. I think he's mentioning like boost. Oh, uh, I mean, when uh, I uh, symmetric uh, transformation uh -huh. acting on state vectors, they should be uh, preserved is transition amplitude. Yes, yeah. so it must be unitary. That's right. Unitary. Yeah, but I think. Oh, the on field operator yeah, can yeah, be different. Yeah. So it is the same in a sense, in the following sense. So consider uh, like say A and operator A and then acting on B. This is typical observable appearing in quantum mechanics, including quantum field here. Like this, say I can prepare by acting field, field acting on the back and so on. And then I can, I can also look at the you know, product of the field operators, for instance. So this is also the object appearing in the quantum field theory too. So suppose I do make the transformation of state in this case. So I'm making a state like, Transform state by some unitary transformation, and then and then also a unitary transformation. So I, I I transform the state together with the same unitary transformation. But if there's a notion of a conjugation, I can rewrite this as that. So that is same as asking you know leave the state invariant, but just to do the transformation on the state. Sorry, on the operator with exactly this unitary transformation, which is exactly that unitary transformation that I'm using. Okay, there was a question there. Uh, I'm afraid it's quite a trivial question, but uh, on the right side, the second row, on your, uh, your notation, uh, yeah. is it x prime or x minus x prime or just x? Uh, I, I meant the minus x, just. So, 
So I'm okay. So you, you, you might be asking because I, I did that. So I'm kind of good. So either way, basically, I'm saying if I if I've been given an integration of x, like the line integral, if I flip the direction by change of variable, so now you sort of hold this to be your next one. I'm saying transform in the new variable integration the same as before. That's all I'm saying. There was another question. You. I wonder whether 30 all the or even has super minimum or one can just really choose one, at least in this case. Good, so good. So uh, I, I would like uh, I would like slightly more um, contentful statement in a minute once I start adding some interactions. So in this case, uh, it is trivially invariant, if you like, okay? And then it is trivially invariant, A, because it has it is a completely only quadratic area. Okay, but it happens to be so in such a way. Okay, so so why why can I add one extra term and then probably ask you your question? Because that there will be some better way of answering your question. All right. So in addition to this, now let me add a set of uh, other other terms. So in other words, let me start adding a term that looks like uh, that 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 looks like like five eight four three. Okay. Now, this is not a free theory, right? This is free theory. This is a quadratic theory. If you only think that this theory knows what to do, it's a still a free propagation, right? So now I have interaction. But I wrote interaction specifically in the sense that this is a you know, even power in field. Okay? Now, if you run the same argument, everything is the same. Here, instead of n square, there is additional term, which is m to the fourth for this term, right? Because because there is one vector of m for each field, this is m to the five to the four. So it comes with this becomes with m to the four times the same thing. Okay, so there's a fair transformation. So you see that again, uh, if I choose either plus or minus sign, because you need to do so to to uh, keep the quadratic term invariant, and it automatically leaves a distance invariant too. For that matter, I can add any even power field, right? So you, what, one lesson you learn is that for any even power of field, you cannot discern whether the, your field must behave as a scalar under parity or pseudo-scalar under parity, right? Either of Now, going back to your question, in this example, will parity do anything? Yes, it does something. Because now if you try to say, OK, let me try to see if I can measure some process that goes like there's one particle, another particle, and it turns into a third particle. Such a process requires for instance, one to three fields. So in other words, this can be done only if you have some, something like five to the cube interactions. Okay? Suppose you're given something like this theory and you know definitely there's such a thing, you're curious whether there's also five to the cube interaction at all. Right? Then you go out and try to measure and measure and measure and never found this out in your protocol. In that case, yes, parity, for instance, said that, oh, uh, this term. Um, okay, Prop, let me, let me, so parity can do something, but in this case, this is not forbidden by parity, but it does something. So, so why, why don't we just discuss it in more detail? Okay, and then there's another example which I already talked about, and then parity will start doing real something. Okay, we will build up. All right, so, good. So this, this can go away. <clears throat> So now, uh, instead of this, let's consider the following theory. Uh, so, so that was the example with S1, for instance. So now let's talk about S2. So which is now, uh, uh, in addition to the kinetic terms, so like S0, the original kinetic terms. Now, let me only add, now let me only add, uh, for instance, G, and then by A to the Q. Okay, so for now, let's just assume that I'm doing for all things first. Okay. If you like, you can just consider here with only single fermion, a single a scalar, so that there is no problem with that. Now let's ask what happened, whether this can do something, uh, something for us. Now this will do something for us because this one is invariant under parity either scalar or, or, uh, or pseudo scalar, right? As we talked about. Now, if you look at this, obviously this. Is only invariant if you take plus one for 
for all scalars that are appearing in this particular interaction. Right? So additional interaction therefore nails down. In this case, you'll learn that. Um, Must be uh, parity. Let me just use this word parity scale. By which I mean it should follow scalar law under the parity transformation. Okay, so additional information, additional interaction should start nailing down things more. Let's let's keep going. <clears throat> The the X should be minus, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, for this business, I should not say, okay, I'm not responsible for minus. I know that's terrible thing to say. I should be. Okay, so let's build up more. So now let's consider S3. Now, again, uh, I consider uh, S with the four scalars. I really, I really like, like this part of the discussion. Yeah. So please uh, go and read. Okay. Where? So, in addition to this, now we are going to add the following term. There's some coupling constant, and then mu nu no sigma, and then one, two, three. Okay, so now let's ask A, whether this theory can be parity invariant, B, if so, uh, what are the transformation law that each of these scalar must test, right? Good. So, so we already know that this term is, is invariant under either choice. Let's just look, look at this term. term. So, so that term, term under the parity transformation goes like this. Like this. So first of all, we learned, uh, we, we recognize that this is not zero, only it has uh, sorry, one, two, zero, one, two, three, okay? Or any permutation of that. So effectively, therefore, there's a time one, and then it's going to have a flip uh, doing a parity transformation. Okay, so let me be more careful. So that term will transform as F1, F2, oh, F3, F4, and then there's the integration. But I told you the integration measure uh, would be invariant under any. Right? So I'm not worried too much about it. Here in X bar. And then X by two, Y three, F. Okay? So I just wrote down exactly explicitly the parity transformation allowing possible, you know, uh, uh, thing in front. I haven't. The only thing that I assume here is that parity doesn't mix up among different fields. So that's what, one thing that I assumed. Okay? So phi 1 goes to phi 1 with some possible phase. Phi 2 goes to phi 2 with possible phase. That's all I have to talk about here. Okay? So let's see. With that assumption, whether this theory can be varied under the parity. So now again, like, like I just do, I can do the change of variable. Let's do say that this is x prime, and then this will become minus sign, this will become minus sign, this will become minus sign, but this will not become minus sign. So overall, what I'm gonna get is over minus one times m1, m2, m3, m4 times the action, original action, right? And then I won't, I'm asking whether this can be invariant under the parity transformation. <laughs> okay, so you know that overall this product should supply overall minus i. And that can be achieved. If one is minus sign three, the rest three is plus, or if three is minus sign or one of them is plus, right? So you learn in this theory, you can have a parity variance if uh, either, let me just write, but either there is just one parity scalar and three parity pseudo scalar. 
or if there is a three parity scalar and one parity scalar. There are two options, uh, uh, and it should be there. Now, uh, let me go back to that question, whether parity actually can do something in, in this type of theory. The answer is yes. Suppose uh, I am not very well trained in field theories. I say, oh, I know that parity should come with a scalar law. And I just plug in, I say, oh, this theory does have a parity. Suppose I said that. Okay? I just had a really, really just believe that parity should come with a ball back so much. That I declare that this theory does not have parity. Then what's going to happen? Well, you screwed up. Theory never screwed up. What do I mean by that? Once you write down theory, whether field theories recognize a particular symmetry or not, the theory always knows. Okay, it's your problem whether you recognize the symmetry or not. This theory always knows every single bit of mysterious symmetry it is. What do I mean by that? Suppose you start writing down all the observables, cross sections, decay rate, all of that, all of that. Every single one of those observables respect 100% of symmetry this theory does have, possibly have. Again, regardless whether you actually recognize those symmetry or not. So even if I did not recognize this thing, this will respect the symmetry in every single dynamics it has. Okay? And this may be one. Maybe I'm not, I'm not discovering full set of symmetries yet. Okay? Maybe there's more, like mixing up the different components together and so on and so forth. If such a thing exists, all dynamics knows it. It's just like human being does it. Okay? That's why we are still discovering new symmetries under the name of general symmetry. That thing was there like hundreds of years ago. It's just a human being that we're understood so far. Same here. Um, but, but isn't the possibility that I just wrote down the wrong interaction in there? Uh, well, so that's a philosophical direction now. Okay. Like I'm saying, uh, like we can also say which interaction I want to write down, right? We, 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 can, we can go from that starting point. Like, can I write down this interaction? Can I not write down this interaction or not? Okay. Uh, there are certain cases where some, some of the interaction you must not write down, for instance. When, when do you get such a, such a restriction? You, when you start touching sacred principles, like you know, Lorentz invariance, causality, locality. But other than that, parity, I'm totally happy to screw up. Okay, I'm okay with like losing parity, for instance. So, so then it's a matter of actually guessing the interaction that the nature may enjoy or not. Is it a parity part of the Lorentz transformation? Good. So there's a Poincaré group, which is divided into the four pieces. And one of them is called proper orthochronous piece. Yes. This, I, we know that the nature respect so far. But the rest, we don't care. The rest is connected by parity and time reversal. So we already know that Sena model does respect parity. So when you say that something of curious Lorentz Inver, you were saying just saying that it respects the only the proper or something. So far. Yeah, yeah, so far. That's not a mathematical theorem. But that's so far we believe, like not just me. We are not talking about religion here, by the way. We're talking about science. So there are a group of people, smart, nice, kind, friendly people. Uh, so far worked out that they 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 understood so far that the that the proper kernels part has not been touched by nature, by uh, but it may be at some point. Okay, so so that's the point that I wanted to say is that um if the symmetry is there, it's there. Now we that's what we study to see whether we can recognize that or not. Yes. I wonder that we assume that Ashland is invariant under parity symmetry. Uh, in this case, the question is if someone dropped this action to me, okay, let's say my wife dropped to me, then I have to follow her, right? Then say, oh, is there a parity invariance here or not? That's my task. I have no right to ask where they come from because my wife gave me, I have to take it. My job is to see whether there's some symmetry here or not. Okay, I'm saying, then I'm checking this. Oh, can I have a parity? Yes, if I do this. So you find that some condition that action can parity symmetry? Yes, so good, good. So, so good question. Let me say that again, given the action, A, I ask whether this theory can be parity invariant. If so, as a part of the exercise, what kind of parity transformation law 
scalars must satisfy in order for the action to have that parity transformation. So there's ambiguity, what, I mean, what we mean by parity transformation. So in fact, let me say one more thing about that. So if, if um, so this is, this is relevant for the point. Suppose you find what a version of parity transformation on B, let's say, and then you found that the that works, meaning this operation has in the sense of acting as edge-weight transformation on the field, that leaves action in there. Suppose you find one such rule, okay, on each of the fields. And then suppose you also have a set of internal symmetries, like SO2, U1, and stuff like that. Then you can always define a new notion of parity, which is some proper version part of these two. Okay, you can call it this is my parity transformation, no problem. You might say, oh, this is like very ambiguous. It is ambiguous. But nevertheless, the key point is that so long as you capture a full set of transformation, meaning in, in, in your basis, you include both internal symmetry part and some level of a parity, then you will not lose information about the dynamics. You know, is that clear? In other words, this is a change of basis. Either you choose that way or you take this axis untouched and then you just make a linear combination of these two to make that, that thing and your basis of symmetry. But you still have both information, right? And so this will still give you necessary information about the dynamics. That's what I'm saying. Yes. It is like doing it, you're taking parity out of the taking parity out of the range of the Lorentz transformation. Yeah. yeah. When you say that if if by Lorentz transformation, if you met the proper orthochronos, yes, I'm taking that out of it. Yes. Okay, let's move on. So that was the third. Let's move on to the uh, fourth. Can I have like yeah. why why the parity transformation acts on field operator linear? Oh, we we assuming here. Uh, uh, we are assuming linear transformation law. We can ask whether you can we can think about nonlinear transformation. Again, some theory which I don't know. May maybe you can write down some theory, and such a theory may respect. May respect the parity only if you are cleverly figuring out the nonlinear transformation. Maybe possible. possible. Again, stupidity is on us, not the theory. It's just like how clever we are. And we, you know, for example, of a nonlinear transformation, BRST transformation, for instance. So in nature, there exists a symmetry transformation which is nonlinear in field. In fact. Well, this is just one example that is linear. So, so um, I'm not sure if there, there's a mathematical theorem per se, but here I'm taking like you know perturbative theory, you know super super linear, everything is completely linearized. So, assuming uh, that the any symmetry that I want to talk about has to be linearized in this sense. For instance, um, maybe some of you that doesn't understand what I'm saying. We can talk about nonlinear realized symmetry like spontaneous breaking. And then there you know that it's a horrendously nonlinear transformation, right? But but here, you know, I just wrote like a quadratic term and then like some interaction. That's why I'm exploring that possibility. All right. So let's move on to the first possibility. So now let's consider the kinetic term of the four real scalars. Then let's write down two epsilon. Does that make sense to you now? Does this condition make sense to you now? Yes. Good. So now we are becoming quantum theorists. All right. So I'm, you know, I made that. All right. So now let's check. All right. So this thing is good either. We learn. Either is good. And then this thing I, works only if I pick the plus sign, right? And this one requires one plus 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 or minus point. Let's see the same one. Where did it come from? So it should be either that or that, right? So there's a conflict, conflict between these two. Okay. So here, naively, uh, this theory cannot be carried in that area. Okay. So I, I, I first remain to be naive for now and move on to the next, but I will come back later after I finish the discussion about time reversal, and then I will hopefully have time to talk about approximate parity symmetry. Okay, for that I need to introduce some of the notions like 
the mass dimension of the coupling and then and stuff like that. Okay, so there's one example where somehow I, I failed to discover pair pair transformation. Maybe I'm not or comma is not clever enough. Maybe you can think <laughs> about some other uh, possibility like parity mixing of different stuff or nonlinear stuff, whatever. Okay, if you can find one, come back. So let's talk about the last option. Now let's consider this. And then in, in addition to that, let's consider uh let's add a, a set of complex complex fields. Like uh, n some difficult mass possible. There's one complex field, and then we are gonna have this interaction is u u plus square. Um and then if I have to write. Okay, and then suppose I also add this thing that I just talked about. So without this complex like, complex uh, scalar set, I know that this theory does have a parity, right? We talked about it. That's the that example, right? Now, in addition, uh, let me say, okay, I'm just following Thomas as an example. Let's add this term on top. Meaning, I just multiply the that from to this. Okay, so now let's run the machinery again. Good. The kinetic term is, is invariant under the parity either way. And this thing demands that all real scalars must have a plus nine. So I have to impose plus, plus, and plus, and plus. But then I know that under the parity transformation, overall, this guy will pick up the minus sign. So that was the problem, right? So the question is whether can I cure that if this guy picked up the overall minus, minus sign under the parity transformation? That's the task. And you know it, 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 it can be made that way. If parity inverse parity is I this and obviously conjugate part I, so I can replace so if this, if I hypothesize this transformation law, then I know this case under the parity field of minus sign, which compensates that parts over everything, the entire theory, it can be parity there. So this example is formatted to illustrate that the coefficient M that I used to call did not be just plus the minus sign. And most of the time we see that, right? But if this example illustrates that, you know, whatever. And this whatever is basically the idea behind it too. So again, once you can define a definition of parity, obviously there's a second definition can immediately pop out if there is an extra internal symmetry, right? So the notion of parity can be um, ambiguous up to that much of a, 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 you know, a uncertainty or uh, anyway. Is, is that clear what I'm saying? Okay. Okay, here too, suppose, we, I, I, I've been done that I say, oh, this almost should take only plus minus sign. I fail to find the proper definition. I say, oh, parity is not here. Once again, if you do the experiment, then every single data will preserve parity according to this rule, whether or not we like it. Okay? So that, that's how things work. Was there a question? I heard some voice. Was not, there was no voice. I heard something. So then, then was... <clears throat> I'm, I'm damaged. I definitely have some voice. Okay, let me move on. Yeah, yes. Why why parent doesn't work for the uh, derivative? Why is not transformed to derivative with respect to why why doesn't act on here? Again? Why it does not change its derivative with respect to minus x? So oh, it changes x to minus x. No, good. So uh I think I think you can understand that way too. In other words, if you if you start with the flipping minus on here, flipping all the x part right to from the beginning, then with a single change of variable, you just go back to yourself. I think it's equivalent. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. No, you probably might say that way. They, they might be a better way of thinking about it because parity begins as a space time transformation like that. So. Uh, I wasn't trying to think in terms of active transformation and just uh, leave the background in there. 
but but I think it's totally uh, good to think your way, or maybe that's the way people think. Yeah. Yeah, it's always confusing. To yeah. So I think it's not totally good. So you already start with the minus 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 my force of flip is a measure two, for instance. Uh, it's it's good, but you have to take into account the fact that the measure doesn't shift change neither over minus sign because there are three minuses. We have to take into account the fact that there is this flipping of uh, integration limit. Therefore, it's going back to yourself. Another question. So I have uh, roughly ten minutes to talk about time reversal. What condition M should satisfy? Uh, which condition M must be satisfied? Yeah. Uh, so if there's a notion of uh, reality, M should be charged in such a way that reality is fulfilled, for instance. Like if it is a real scalar, obviously you cannot turn the real scalar into the complex scalar. So M should be real. And that's why we've been talking about plus minus sign for real scalars. But phi is complex, then the reality condition can be uh, lifted up. So in that case, for instance, I can play with I there too. Uh, I thought that uh, M is a matrix that uh, changes a uh, phi a so but as it is a parity so if M square M square should be um, identity times phase vector phase vector. Uh, where, where, did, where, where does M square come? Are you thinking of real scalar now? Uh, no, no, no. In general, uh, the parity operator, I think, if we uh, take parity apart uh, two times, yeah. then the system doesn't change, in my opinion. So, in that sense, M square should be satisfied that identity times phase vector. Okay, so let's let's see. Okay, is it clear? Is it okay? No, I understand what you're saying. So if we make to pair it twice, it seems like going back itself. Um, so naively field has to go back to itself modular phase. This is this is the question of uh, realizational symmetry projectively. So there's there's possible phase ambiguity. Um, yeah, I think I think that's true thing so far. And uh, every example that I think I have shown may may fall into the category. 뭐 예를 들어서 pi one and pi two가 있으면 그걸 바꾸는 것도 괜찮겠죠. So that, that's what I sort of mentioned this 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 uh, this thing, right? So if you find a notion of a parity that works for you, then you can always superimpose with other in, internal symmetries, which may be some different component. You can take that as your definition of parity too. Yeah. Yes. So when you change the sign of the measure, why why the partial derivatives and the argument in the scale field changes everything? The, the, the argument. Yeah, the scalar field remains minus, but but the derivative sign. Good. So that's related to some question that. So, um, okay. L let me phrase away uh, what he said. So suppose I define a parity transformation in such a way that a field must display like minus uh, x must play over the field argument. Then b, all the x I see, for instance, must play two. Uh, I give two, for instance. Then I show you that this is the same as the original measure. And then I can make a change of variable here but, you know, overall, basically. So in other words, everywhere I can just now just make a change of variable like that. Then you see everything is cleaned up, everything is cleaned up. And the only thing, uh, oh, you, then you're going to say, what well, is the minus sign? Yeah. When you change the measure of minus 2x, minus x to x, uh, then, here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then the minus sign for partial derivative is plus, but 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 minus x in scalar field remain minus. What? Why do they change transform separate? Okay, let me see if I understand you. At least I see one conflict. If I do that way, the way that I just did. Yeah, so if I just do what I just did, then um, I wonder if I do make a change of variable. I actually ended up washing out minus the fact. Is that the case? 
That seems to be the case. So I think we have to think physically. So suppose here's a background space in time, right? And there is a particle X here. Meaning if I cannot even uh, think about any state at all, I can't even think of any transformation at all. Like there's empty space, blah. So there's a particle. Then I can have a, I, I have a, a meaningful notion of parity, right? So, okay, so X goes by like that. In other words, if the particle were moving like that, then, since the momenta is the derivative of x, if I flip x, that particle goes backwards. So that's the mirror symmetry, right? There's a mirror particle going that way, mirror looks like particle approaching opposite way, right? There's a mirror particle to that, mirror says, no, there's a guy that coming that way, so it's opposite direction, okay? So uh, I'm saying this because uh, there, there is a notion of a parity transformation only in terms of a quantum field. Just like, uh, just like we talked about this, right? So there's a state, like particle state that I produce. And then I can ask what happens to that if I do flipping of uh, x to the minus x, that that will come out as like flipping the direction of the momentum and so on and so forth. There's all physical meaning. Or I can say that, no, 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 let me not imagine of doing it at all. I only, you know, think of, Changing the operator that proposes things. I, I should not miss both. So, when I was formulating this exercise, basically I was thinking to this kind of future, all the way through. And probably, so I think, I think I have to think a little bit more carefully, but I, that's why I don't want to mix up both. Okay? And I was thinking to the hydrogen future. So, I should not mix up Schrodinger thing and then hydrogen thing. They can crash. You see, that's exactly canceling out the effect. Just like if you do make a shredding of transformation, transformation shredding a picture, and then you also make a Heisenberg picture transformation, they, they always cancel out. You don't get to see anything yet. That's exactly what I just saw. Okay? So, so good. So therefore, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, uh, let me, so I think we have to just stick to one picture, one or the other. So here, I just I was doing only the hydrogen. Can I just identify pressure derivatives as momentum? So it's, it is kind of um, operating. Well, well, good. So then be careful. We are doing quantum field theory, not the quantum mechanics, though. So then when you say momentum of what? So in this case, the momentum should be causing a momentum of the field. Again, so we have to be careful a little bit. Right? Given a system, what is a variable, what is a quantum momentum? And let's move on from there. So I'm not doing relativistic quantum mechanics. I'm doing quantum field theory. So that's tempting direction, but, but I think I did kind of that too. Think about it, and you come back to me if there's any other point, except that I have three minutes. So I have to go. I have to, I have to discuss time work. I don't want to resume symmetry next week. Let's go. Okay, so time reversal. So obviously this flips t goes to minus t, and then x to s. So basically you run the movie backwards. That's what this does. So if there were a particle going that way, it will go that way, right? This time, not because you pull it the x direction, because you pull it the t direction, but momentum is a time derivative. So under the time reversal, it is negative time derivative you're going backward. Okay. So good. Now the question is: oh, can we find what's the unitary operator that realizes time reversal? Oops. Okay, so that's the question. Now the, the claim is that this is not gonna work. Not simply it doesn't work nicely, but because it will crash with the principles, like causality. Okay, let's see how, uh, that's how that works quickly. So suppose I look at the system where I had a Q of T or P of T, but we can certainly replace this with a phi of T, uh, 
uh, uh, the field, I mean, and then if it's called given moment that doesn't matter, it's the same thing, okay? Notation. And uh, we know that the quantum theory does satisfy parameter commutative relation like that. And let me remind you, this is not for the sake of convenience. This is nothing but consistent initial condition, right? This is a condition, initial condition consistent with the causality that you need to solve second order Klein Gordon equations. So what was the logic? Logic was any relativistic field theory must satisfy a Klein Gordon equation, number one. It's a second order differential equation, so you need a two. Uh, two initial conditions to solve it. And then there's a certain uh, restriction on that because you have to satisfy causality. And there's only causal initial conditions that take exactly this form, right? So this is not just you know random expression, but this is the expression you need to take to be consistent with causality. Now, let's play with this. Last time I showed that uh, unitary operator or actually, I brought that in the case of any unitary, uh, means that it's also linear. So let me quickly write down the definition of it. So if you have A and B, and then if you made a U, A, U in transformation, unitary means that it leaves the norm, not just norm, in a product invariant. That's the definition of unitary. Linear means if there's a U, the U acts on the two states, like alpha coefficient times A state, beta coefficient times B state, then it acts linearly without conjugating the coefficient. That's linear. And we can show that unitary necessarily imply linear. Now, with that much of, much of understanding, let's apply uh, what happened if I apply this to that, okay? So suppose there is a unitary representation of a time reversal transformation. So under the time reversal, this goes to the plus minus t, and the t, which is schematically Q dot goes to minus of P or minus T. Okay? So what does that mean? So now let's work. So this expression can be written slightly nicely like that. What they mean is if there is a unitary operator, and then if I have an operator, then it means that it turns back into this. Then likewise, if I had a P of T, minus Okay, so that's what it is. So now let's apply it here. U of P, Q, P, I, U of T. So this side, I already told you that Q goes to Q, P goes to minus P. So it comes with, I'm just wrapping a T here, argument T per second, is equal to. U of t dagger i u of t. But if u is unitary, u is linear, so it does nothing to the to the function, right? So it comes out with plus that. Which means that what does that mean? If you have a system, quantum mechanical system, quantum field theory, if that satisfies these nice important properties, you must satisfy to be consistent with causality. Under the time reversal, this will flip. Now, this will satisfy yield defined communication relation. So, lesson is that uh, unitary realization of time reversal symmetry is not, cannot be consistent with the causality. Okay, so you have to avoid that. Second evidence it is quickly, what well, quickly? <laughs> if you tell very good. So, so, second evidence, well, this is life. <laughs> this is life. I'm going to have to take another like, five minutes, 10 minutes uh, next class. But let me give you a second evidence. And then uh, hopefully you are super curious how those are solved. Either you can go back and read it by yourself or you come back to lecture. So, second evidence is that suppose now I take a, a time, time uh, evolution operator. And then let's also study what happened if I take unitarily realize time reversal symmetry. So, so the, the, this obviously, mean, first of all, means that I have to split the time. So that means it should be I, A, T, P. Right? So I literally performed what I mean, what I meant by time reversal. So now let's work it out to linear order in T and drop the T. That gives me U, T, dagger minus I, H, U, T. 
and then on this side it should be right here. Now again, if this is unitary, that is the linear, that means it is minus i u dagger e h u t is equal to my plus i u i h. So if I drop the i, what you get is that time universal transformation of Hamiltonia send h to minus h. What does that mean? If you started with the Hamiltonia, which is nice and good, so that every spectrum is a bounded from below. But then if you pass on to the time reversal symmetric version, it completely does this. You're just falling to the hell. Goodbye. Okay, so you clearly see that unitarily real life time reversal is sick. Okay, and we know the rescue to this, which is to say that it should be realized as an integer operator, that we, which will continue next time. You are not a lot of SMA questions. All right, I'm going to leave. All right, so clean up. See you uh, next Monday. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.